So, welcome to what I think is number 21 or number 22 of our Worlds of Speculative Fiction series. We're finishing up the year strong with Octavia Butler. Uh, used to be called Xenogenesis, now they call it the Lilith Brood Trilogy. Um, and so, we're going to talk primarily about that. Um, you, you know, all of you are, are old hands at this now, so you know, we talk a little bit about biography, some preliminary remarks, and then jump into the world building. And boy, she's, she's doing a lot of that in, in this, this work. Uh, the narrative world is extremely rich and very alien. Um, and then we'll, we'll talk about some philosophical themes that I picked out, and we can always talk about whatever you guys were struck by in it. I, um, I found some interesting, uh, you know, quotations by her from, from a number of different interviews uh, and one essay as well that, that I think are going to be kind of useful. Um, so I'm going to begin with, with the first one. This is from Writers and Books. She was asked, you know, what kind of writer she is. Is she a sci-fi writer? And she said, I consider myself a writer. As you're probably aware, it's unbelievably boring to have people continually trying to get you to define, or are you writing speculative fiction or science fiction? And she says, is it a good story? That's what's really key. If so, accept it as that. And then she went on to talk a little bit about her biography. She says, I don't think my mother had any awareness of science fiction or any other genre. She had only three years of education. She was pulled out of school early to be put to work. My grandmother was widowed about the time. Ah, come on in. The, the depression started. This meant that a lot of her older children, they were poor anyway, didn't get to get an education. Um, she was glad I was inside reading because if I, if I was in the house reading, I wasn't out getting into trouble and maybe I might survive. So science fiction for her, you know, she's got a very different attitude towards, towards you know, writing and, and reading in, in general. And she says, I think the reading was not nearly as suspect as the writing. Uh, I think the family that I know as her family were alarmed I actually imagined I could earn a living writing <laughs> stories, right? Which is a di difficult prospect. Um, it's interesting how many science fiction writers actually get going when they're very young. I was on a program with Greg Bear. He mentioned he'd gotten started writing when he was eight. I began writing when I was ten. She says, I think we're influenced by the stuff. We find it and we love it and we're influenced by it. I know I collected my first rejection slip when I was 13 and went on collecting them for a long time after that. So that, that's kind of a good segue into talking about her, her biography. Um, you know, like a lot of the people that we've looked at, she had some periods where uh, it seemed like she couldn't sell anything. Um, she had to struggle against, um, you know, the, the sort of taking rejection too, too much to heart and, and stopping writing uh, because of that. So why don't we start with, with the biography. Um, so she's born in Pasadena, and her, her you know, mother and father um, will get married, um, but her father dies when she's pretty young. So he's out of the picture. She, moves, she and her mother move in with her, her mother's family. They're pretty strongly religious. Um, they're growing up uh, in, in Pasadena, which to some degree was you know, less segregated than many cities. Uh, you know, Octavia Butler and her family are. African American, so so she got to see quite a bit of, of racial dynamics at work at a time when you know this is long before uh, the, the well the civil rights struggle is going on, but it's long before the legislation is going into to work. Um, she she recalls you know like going along with her mother to to work. Uh, her mother worked as a maid, and um, she got to see how how these sorts of uh, dynamics played out. Um, <clears throat> and she also, you know, starts writing stories when she's 10. She convinces her mother to buy her a typewriter. And apparently these weren't science fiction stories. She said they were horsey stories. Which, yeah, and I don't know sense. much about them. Yeah. yeah I, well, sense. you know, uh, that, I, I, I suppose too, especially at that, that time, you know, there's a lot of uh, steering girls towards that. And then something really interesting happens that I actually thought was worth putting into the the. Bi the biographical timeline, she sees this um, sci-fi movie from about, I think, five years before called Devil Girls from Mars. I don't actually know anything about it. And she, she says in her interviews, it was a terrible movie. Sounds and, like something late night. Yeah, well, I, I probably, yeah, it was probably one of those, like, uh, you, you know, like, 
these happen in both. Yeah. Those, like, those, those be, you know, those, those be like we had Shock things. Theater and yeah. Son of Sven Gulli and right. all sorts. Of, so yeah. there, there was probably that. And she gets convinced. She, 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 her response to it is, I could do better than that. And so she starts writing science fiction stuff. And that's when, like, the, the, the um, you could say the, the outlines or the, the catalyst for um, the patternist novels that she's going to write start getting put down on paper. Um, so she's, you know, like a lot, of, a lot of the people that we've looked at, they started writing pretty early, um, and they didn't worry an awful lot about, um, what would you say, like finding, writing exactly the right way. They're kind of puttering around with it and, and seeing what worked. Um, she was kind of, I mean, she, she talks about being very tall, very early, um, not, not having a good time with other kids, getting bullied by them, um, and, and staying inside quite a bit. She graduates from, from high school, and she starts working odd jobs and uh, attending Pasadena City College, um, working on her associates. And she, she graduates from there in about three years uh, with an associates in history and then goes to um, California State College in Los Angeles, um, changes from that to doing um, writing courses with UCLA, but, but continues working like all these different jobs here and there. And her writing, um, she said, would often happen sort of in the wee hours of the night. Um, so again, like some of the other people that we've, we've looked at, uh, before they make it big, um, I mean, in the end, she really does make it big in a very unique way. Gonna... Well, I, I know you're going through the yeah. chronologically, but... The MacArthur she, thing attracted your attention. She, well, she, she got the genius grant then. She, and she is the, yeah, she is the first, like, person awarded that for science fiction. Oh. And, yeah, yeah, she, they... they they gave it to her. It wasn't, I think now it's like a million bucks, right? 500,000. Oh, five, okay. So back then it was 220 something thousand. Yeah. So I guess it's, it's gone up quite a bit. And that really helped her out. She also, at one point, um, for her store, for her, her, her uh, novel Kindred, after she'd already published a couple other novels, she got a $5,000 advance. So that would have been in the mid 70s. That would have gone a long way. It's $5,000 back then. Um, she talked about that in, in a few interviews. Are you going to talk about why the Xenogenesis trilogy became out of print and then reissued as this? That I don't actually know. Oh, okay. But I think we may have somebody who might know. No, I don't know why, why they brought it back. I, I, probably popular demand, I think right? Popular demand. Didn't it come back after she died? That's a good question. Uh, they have come back um, as a result of her death. So, because Willis Brood was then published posthumously, but it was a reissue of the it was original a three. Of the original, yeah. Okay. Yeah. But, okay. So yeah, I mean, the Xenogenesis three. was the one that I uh, that, that that was the name under which I was reading them Where before. Was that published, um, Brood, this one, the first trade edition, is two thousand, so she was still alive. She was alive, yeah. She um, was in 2006. Originally published as the Xenogenesis mm -hmm. trilogy, which which has. Uh, actually, kind of cooler cover art than this. This looks yeah. kind of uh, it looks like a real schlock, I know. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's interesting. It's as if they would have taken C.S. Lewis's like Out of the Same Planet and Carol and something else, and then turned it into like you know a western planets and stuff or something yeah. like that. You know, and just reissued. Well, you know, it. with the Kindred novel, uh, they were trying to talk her into <laughs> turning it into like a romance novel. Oh, and this is after she published a few actual novels, um, so she, you know, I guess the 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 story, the the the, the mo not the not the model, the moral of the story is, you're never so big that people won't try to sell you on doing something different with your work than yeah. you want to do. Yeah. So, now jumping back a little bit, one one of the things that I think was really key for her, she and she talks about this um, in, in, again in many interviews was um, participating in this open-door program that the Screen Guild Writers of America had. Um, and it was supposed to, you know, promote young, poor, uh, you know, all, including also minority writers, sort of an outreach program. And, and these sorts of things, she said, were really important because otherwise she wasn't coming into contact with, with you know, people like her. And, and so getting together in these writing workshops is really important. She also meets Harlan Ellison there. And Harlan Ellison takes 
an interest in her career and winds up, um, you know, making connections for her. He was a very assertive guy, to say the least. Um, some might, might call him, you know, more on the aggressive scale. Uh, and he's the one who, who suggests that she go to the Clarion Science Fiction Writers Workshop, which means she leaves California and, and, and uh, travels. There she meets Samuel Delaney, a number of other people. It's a six-week program, and that opens the door for her. And her first work, her first uh, novella is published in the anthology that comes out of that. Mm -hmm. So that's what kind of opens the door for her. You notice that there's um, a long gap from 1971 to 1976. She's unable to actually get anybody to buy her stuff. She keeps working on things, um, gets a lot of rejection letters, and uh, can't, can't seem to get any traction. And then um, things start to click. And she, you know, starts to get uh, recognized and, like I mentioned, gets an advance. She uses part of that to travel by, by Greyhound across the United States, getting to see different, different parts. Um, and, you know, by the 1980s, she's getting recognized, you know, in terms of awards. And I, I only actually put some of the awards that she received on here. Um, and she's, you know, pretty consistent with, with uh, writing and... and uh, you know, development of these, these stories. She, you know, she works in terms of, what would you call it, like large-scale projects, like, like this, three novels that each, you know, continue a common pattern. Um, and she doesn't just stick with one narrative world, like some of the authors that we've looked at where they almost, you, you, I mean, if we want to be a little derogatory, we'd say they, they ride it, you know, into the dust, um, or you know, we might say they milk it for everything it's worth. She doesn't. She doesn't do that. When she thinks that something is done, she's she moves on to the next uh, project. Um, she 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 ended up traveling quite a bit and um, working some of that. In, like you know, when she was traveling to the Amazon and the Andes, she was doing that in part for research on these these novels. Um, and as you pointed out, she she wins the uh, the MacArthur Genius Grant. Um, she said uh, they didn't measure my IQ, um, so I'm not sure that I am a genius, but, you know, that, that's pretty good. And um, she, she dies pretty young, unfortunately, um, really cut short. Um, they think that she probably had a stroke, and then she, she falls, um, sustained some injuries. She was only 56 when she dies, um, and so it, it, it cut her career Short, but but already she had accomplished you know quite a lot. There's a whole string of novels. She was teaching people how to write. She was conducting these workshops. Um, she she was enough of a writer to have gone through a dry spell with rejection slips and a dry spell with writer's block and still produce a lot of stuff. So and you know that kind of tells you a good bit about her. Um, and you know I have some other. Uh, uh, things that are sort of her reflections on her own process. Um, so I thought those would be interesting to look at. She talks about science fiction. I think this is a common experience being a boy's genre. Uh, she said it was white, it was adolescent, it involved a particular kind of adolescent best described as a nerd. This did not make it popular with blacks or adults or women for quite a long time. But then some of the best sellers, she says, I think helped to draw people in who otherwise would never touch science fiction. A lot of the science fiction writers have gotten older, a little better accepted. Some of them still write very well, and their books bring people in. And then she points out science fiction writers come from science fiction readers. You know? uh, and I, I think this is, this is more true today, perhaps, than, than it was even back then. You know, people, there's so many people writing now. Um, and where did they get the impetus? I mean, I, I suppose there could be a few people trying to make a buck, right? Where they're like, I'm going to go into this genre because it's really going to pay. But I don't think science fiction is, is a genre like that because there's so many people doing it. Um, and, and, and there's so much um, scrutiny now of, of your, your stuff. People are always ready to say, oh, this is awful, uh, derivative, no good. So I think, you know, it's, it's quite important in order to have good science fiction being generated. We need good models of, of uh, what's counting as science fiction. And, and she's sort of like one of the people who we talked about um, last year, Michael Moorcock, in that she's, 
you know, constantly pushing the envelope, um, trying to see where where else it, it could go. And I think that comes out very strongly in, in these novels in, in particular, where you've got, I, you know, I, I was joking with somebody who I was talking with earlier today. I said, you know, I don't really know those. And I said, well, the people who attend, they're either going to be, you know, pretty interested in, in the stuff that she's talking about, or they're going to be disgusted by it. Because, you know, she's talking about um, sexuality in, in very frank terms. Um, you've got interspecies uh, mating going on, uh, the question of whether the human race is actually going to survive because of this, all this uh, sexual gene crossing. And um, so, you know, I, I think there's, there's something there to be said about that. I, I think this is the sort of stuff that... Um, you know, maybe science fiction authors from a generation before her might have totally turned their nose up at. But, you know, we see people like Moorcock and Farmer uh, and, and Butler really pushing the, the limits on, on, on what could be, what could fit into the frame of, of science fiction. Ursula K. Le Guin, too, I would say, kind of fits into that as well. So she says... Um, I think as more and more blacks begin to read science fiction, then more blacks will take up writing science fiction. This is already happening to a certain degree. She says, I came into science fiction when things were opening up for women, when it was okay to notice the fact that the universe wasn't just white or male. So I could write about black women, black heroines, and not get anybody upset. I got readers who wrote me letters wondering why there always seemed to be a black person in my work, but most people seemed either to accept it or, or shut up about it. Um, and that's coming from the Black Scholar interview uh, in 1986. So, I mean, that's a long time ago. Already things were starting to, to change. Um, and then there's, there's that other one where she talks about what, what influences her. Um, she, um, you know, not only does writing influence her, she says, anything that I come in contact with and I start researching influences me. So she, you know, travels to the Amazon and, and the Andes, and a lot of that goes into the descriptions of the, um, the environment and the fauna in, in this work. So that's a lot of uh, talking on my part. Before we go into the narrative world, um, what were you, you know what were your impressions or? Uh, well, I had a question in terms of just, uh, and this goes beyond, I guess, you know, her. Yeah. As I, I mean, as I look at the biography timeline, and you know, we're getting in. I mean, just sometimes younger, I guess, than some of the other authors, but I mean, yeah. you, know, you look at the 1970s and 1980s, and I think maybe because of you know, the television series or the movies that were starting to come out, that science fiction became more, more mainstream. popular yeah, or yeah. mainstream. So I'm just wondering whether um, that created opportunities for authors like her, who might live distant or not seemingly connected with a lot of others, yeah. writers, whether there was sort of a starting to reach out from afar and, and, and communicate back and forth and talk about, hey, I just read your book, you know, and here's, yeah. you know, that there was more of that going on. I, I don't know. It's a, it's a Yeah, you know, she, she actually talks about, she, she credited Star Wars in particular for really opening things up, particularly for audiences that otherwise weren't going to be interested in science fiction. She, you know, like in that Black Scholar interview, she talks about, Listen, black people went and watched Star Wars, and then we're like, okay, this this is pretty cool stuff. Now we're going to read other authors. Um, and, you know, if you think about it, so we, we had Star Trek, which was late 60s, right? Into mm -hmm. early 70s, I think? 66, 67, 68. So it didn't make it into the 70s. And then what would be like the next really big? We had Battlestar Galactica, which only lasted two seasons, Space 1999, which I think was kind of popular. Uh, which might have been a bit earlier. Um, did we have any other really big sci-fi well, series? Well, you had things like the Twilight Zone and the other yeah, things true, like true. Things that, yeah. that kind of put you, you know, out there in something different, you know, yeah. otherworldly. Um, and those things were big in they the '60s. Big, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, I think I think you guys are right that um, the then other you had stuff lost in space. That's true. Yeah, yeah. Um, so other media is is opening up the door to Projection. print science fiction. <laughs> well, it, yeah, I mean, they're, 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 if we think about cartoons, there probably were quite a few um, sci-fi cartoons or kids show. The sleeve stacks. 
No, that's no, uh, that Land of the Lost. Oh, Land of the Lost. <laughs> yeah. Land of the Lost. That, that was, you yeah. remember the robot? Was yeah. Say, well, what's the heck this name? Oh, my well. God. Wilson. That was so... Yeah. What's that? Wilson, Wilson. Oh yeah, yeah. Danger, danger. But yeah, yeah. I think I think you're right. A lot of that stuff um, created an environment where science fiction could kind of move out of the um, you might call it the pulp ghetto, right? Um, and so she, you know, she's and she's writing at the right time for that, and she's got somebody who is helping her out too, which is you know, Harlan Ellison, um, very polarizing guy, but. If he was on your side, I think that would help out quite a bit because he would get in people's faces. Um, probably, I don't, I don't know enough about this her biography, but I'd be willing to bet that Harlan Ellison probably helped her from getting screwed over on some deals too, because he was a very hard nosed uh, guy in that way. Um, I just think you know, it's it seems like yeah. as a writer of science fiction or speculative fiction, it's a financial challenge to sustain oh, yeah. yourself. So, is it a hobby for somebody like this? And they want to commit more time, but they got to live, so they're really working and doing yeah. different things we don't know about. And yet, they also want to develop uh, as a writer. And so, have reaching out um, when it becomes more popular and, and, and uh, goofy things like long distance rates reduce dramatically, so you can now have you know hours yeah. long conversations, just like now we think of the internet, which opens up a lot of contact. All over the place, you don't even know where some people are physically. Don't yeah. need to know, but I mean, so maybe somewhere in here there was a lot of development going on and influences that we just don't know. I think that, that, I think that's that's probably completely right. Yeah. Um, so you know, the sort of thing that she is experiencing might not have happened, say, in the 1930s. Then, right? You know, yeah, I think that that's probably true. Well, and she was seen as the first African American woman, woman science, science fiction writer. Yeah. Ever. I don't know that she was the first ever. Yeah. That's how she was seen. But yeah. you know, she didn't do any work for the Star Trek series. It seemed like a lot of the authors, no. the writers for Star Trek, I mean, they brought in different people to do different episodes and things. I mean, she's... You know, that, that, because it was a multiracial well, cast from the beginning. Yeah, Harley, yeah but... Harley but and Ellison did work. Yeah. yeah, but I mean, notice she's, she's just graduating from um, Pasadena City College in 68. So she's, she isn't, yeah, yeah, she's not well established. Uh, I mean, she's not gone to those workshops yet. Um, and by then the series is gone. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting because being out in California, this is total speculation, um, it, it, I think it would have been more possible for her to like write for television, yeah. right? Um, but she, you know, she seems to have like, she had all these jobs and she would do jobs you know, she didn't get, a, you know, she didn't get a track, she didn't get um, sentimental about jobs. A job was just there to earn money so she could do her thing, you know, and, and, and also so, so sometimes so she could do research that would go into a story, she said. Um, and, and uh, you know, if she could make it just by writing, then she was good with that, but she did it through, you know, writing novels. Um, she, I, I don't think she, you know, really thought, well, I, I, I can't say this, it doesn't appear that she gave a lot of thought to trying to write for television or something like that. Um, it just, but, I mean, it strikes yeah, me yeah. that, yeah, because where she lived, like you said, the fact that they would she need... She was too young. No, but no, I mean, no, if she could have written in the 70s. In the industry, um, yeah. They look for somebody to help, you know, assistant writer with yeah. some episodes, you know, or whatever. You, you're in the genre. You're meeting some other people who are writing. Yeah. It's she writing for me. It was over. It was over. No, well, Star Trek, I mean, came back. And then it well, back. not Star know. Trek, but there were plenty of other series yeah, going true. on, you know. I, you know, it could have been, too, that, that um, maybe it was harder to break in as, as a woman or, you know, being African-American yeah, into those, those scenes. So I, I don't know. I, I don't know I enough mean, about it. I would it think to, absolutely to that actually say. In the, in that during that period of time. Yeah. It's like, you know, Michael Apted, right? I think we talked about him before. He did the 7-Up series and then oh, 1421, yeah. like all the sequentials. Yeah. He made all of these other movies so that he could fund his that real project. desire, which was to continue that project. And he said that people in the documentary world didn't take him seriously because he had entered into this other realm and people in the sort of more popular, you know, yeah. schlocky films that he made, they were just like, why are you still doing that? Yeah. You know, so I think some, I guess, some 
Yeah, I guess there's there's two ways you could go until you actually have enough recognition that you can sort of make it with your craft, which is, you know, you could like just do something else, like sell insurance by day or, you know, wait tables or whatever, and then do your thing. Or you could do something that's similar to your thing, like what you're saying he's doing, or if she'd done television writing, and right. then do what you really, really want to do on the side. And I guess she thought that it was better to do all the unrelated jobs, you know. I mean, she did get a lot of material out of it. She, t- she gives examples of um, uh, people who, you know, in, in a transfigured way show up later on in her novels. <laughs> so, and, and, you know, I think some of us who have writerly aspirations, we, we sometimes think about, like, you know, terrible jobs that we've had and, and the things, you know, in, in that way, right? Yeah, uh, the Barbara Aaron Ray fixed well, it's all experiences. Yeah. So she can translate into something else. I mean, our son likes to make, you know, he wants to do movies and he's a software engineer to make money to do movies. Oh, yeah, so yeah. That's, that's what, you know, he, he's always had to do something to make movies because it's ridiculously expensive to yeah. do that. Right. So Writing is not quite so expensive. That's that's kind of a better proposition in some respects. <laughs> so true. on that, let's talk about the narrative world. The oh yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. Although now you can self-publish, you know, and, and somebody will probably buy it, you know, at least the copy. Um, so and there's not as much of an onus against it. So, but so the narrative world, you know, um, it's very coherent. It's very rich. Um, you know, like some of the other authors that we've been looking at, there's there's a essentially a universe being developed, and you know these these uh, Oan Kali are at the the center of it. Weird people. Yeah, weird oh my I mean the, the the story is that human the human race has managed to almost kill itself off because of a global thermonuclear war that that pretty much wipes out the the northern hemisphere, which is probably what would happen if we did have a nuclear war. Mm -hmm. Um, The people who would be surviving would be like in South America or in parts of Africa if that didn't get nuked or in Australia. And so the the story picks up 250 years after the war and um, it centers the first book on, on this woman, Lilith. And, you know, one of the things I really liked about these stories that I think Butler... Um, it's a real strength in her writing is, you know, she only reveals bits and pieces, you know, and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And she does so much of it through either description or dialogue. Um, and, you know, she's, these, these Okanali, the, the, yeah. On Kali. Oh, 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 yeah. I, I always get the word mixed yes. up. They really are alien. They really are they weird. Are but weird. she is able to describe them in such a way, um, and their inner life, that I, at least I found I could I could you know make sense of them and relate to them and 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 um, understand where they were coming from, and they're not all on the same page either, um, and and she's able to switch back and forth between humans, and um, on collies and these these hybrids, um, and and through that then she she lays out this this narrative world. I think it's really quite impressive. How she how she did that. I'm glad that you suggested uh, her. Where well, so I, I, I first ran across her was Wild Seed. Okay. That was where I first came across her. Um, and I find it interesting. That everybody focuses on the sex. Yeah. In Willis Brood series, and I when I read, I thought it was more about how do we define being human. Yeah, I think that's one of the the really key. It was really more about themes. how do you define being civilized, how to define yeah. being a race, a species, you know. But but the Anakali, they were, I mean, they, they traded in genes. So, I mean, what they did is they, I mean, I read this so long ago, I'm trying to just pull. Well, that was their survival. Right. And so I, it was more of a selfish, I mean, it was, their survival was based on on mixing every race together to, to but they what couldn't, I didn't, they what couldn't I, survive if they didn't genes. Well, what kind of, yeah. it kind of was weird. Yeah. With, you know, with the whole arms and all of that business. And I mean, and it was obviously yeah. very pleasurable what, you know, what, because you had to have that person, what was the that Uloi. being called? Uloi in yeah. the middle there. Um, but the two humans were never allowed to touch, not even to stroke hair or to do any, they could never do any touching. My well, impression was that they weren't, it wasn't that they weren't allowed to, it was once they bonded yeah. with Uloi, they, they didn't, didn't want to. Yeah. 
Well, they would find it repugnant. They found it repugnant. Did yeah. they? Okay, yeah. Because it seemed to me like um, Lilith was like... Because Lilith tried. Well, yeah. with, with Joseph, wasn't it Joseph? Joseph. Okay. Um, yeah. Like, I think they they were trying to have some kind of contact, but I thought it was not, like the Uloi would say, no, not a lot. No, no, they, no. You know, know, once they made that connection, okay. that was so pleasurable. Yeah. yeah. They couldn't do it without that connection. They and that, found, they found it. They found it icky. Yeah, and that's, I mean, that's kind of an interesting point. The, um, the uh, humans, you know, we, we're much, you might say, harder edged than they are and, and much more towards like, when you look, we're doing things this way or this way. They kind of nudge you, you know, a little bit. This, you know, you don't, you know, you, you, we're, we're not going to like, um, uh, you know, force you into things. But you can really only go this way. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, they're very manipulative, and what they yeah. do is actually quite invasive. I mean, it's really yeah. quite invasive, and they do kind of take away your humanity. Well, let's talk about that theme then, because that was one I wanted. Controlling. That was one that I want. I, I I wanted to think about it in terms of what we call paternalism, right? Mm -hmm. So paternalism is when you make decisions that affect somebody else, and maybe like close off options or offer them options. And you you don't give them full autonomy to participate in that. You may not even give them full knowledge, because um, it, you, the view is it's better for them. And so, like you know, when Lilith first comes on the scene early on in the books, um, they you know they make her stay in the room with the the, the alien, the the mm -hmm. Kali. and um, you know they they don't say, listen, this is up to you or anything like that. They, they put her in a situation, and then over time, she gets more and more freedoms, but they always come with some sort of cost, right? Mm -hmm. And um, they, they change her, her gene sequences so that um, she won't get cancer. Um, there are a lot of places in these stories where some of the characters do, like, ask for what we would call informed consent. Um, but in a lot of cases, it's done, it's done without that, and it's done that way to... To benefit them, in, in the view of the Oan Kali, or to protect somebody else, but we do view, and I, and I think Octavia Butler is setting it up in such a way that she also views some of this as, as you said, invasive, as like transgressing against people's, uh, what would you say, against their rights, against... Well, they're almost parasitic, because they really can't survive without people to do this, even though they make it... It's like this is for your benefit, but it is actually. Well, I mean, they they were surviving before they come to Earth. Off um, other people, off, off other species. They could go genes. to a different species. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, they if you get the impression that they they love engaging in the trade, but they're the kinds of creatures that if they couldn't find another species to trade with, it's not like they would just shrivel up and die. They no, they've developed themselves. They would. Uh, yeah, I thought yeah, they would yeah, too. The yeah, impression they of the really narrative too. was. If they couldn't find a species to trade with, yeah, it would be the end of their species. Yeah, because this way they're very manipulative. When they have sick. to have the trade. But it's not because if if they don't do it, they're going to get sick and die. Like they're, they're the environment can't affect them as much. It's more they have a desire. They they need sort of like you think about somebody who says, "Oh, if I don't watch my my favorite show three hours a day, I'm going to get depressed." Right. It's it's a desire for something that they, that they the have to satisfy. My impression was the gene pool would go bad. It would, would dry up. That was so and much. They had of to keep them. adding genes, right. or else or their else genes the would species, turn against them. The species would. Or that I didn't desire was that so impression. great that if they didn't have it, they weren't going to survive. I mean, yeah, I had that impression. Yeah. That yeah. They had to they had to keep adding different genes. Yeah, but in they delight to, in it. I mean, that's they the did thing. They delight in it, but my impression was it was necessary. It was necessary. Yeah, and it was survival. Hmm. For them. I I don't know. I didn't I didn't get the impression. I, I got the impression that early on they adapted other people's genes because they needed it to to survive, but now they're they're almost indestructible. You know. Yeah, I didn't have the impression they were indestructible. I had the impression they had to have the genes. To survive as a species. Now those there were those hybrids. Um, oh, the constructs they called the them. Um, yeah. Now they they were they had they were destructible. Be and they had certain. I mean, sort of this well, line, of, I was trying to think. Yeah. Of, that the kid the the son of Lilith and um, Akan. Right. Because you know they, yeah. they had these one set of parents, and then mm -hmm. they had these. Uh, there's there so many people involved in these 
mating. Yeah, yeah. So that's <laughs> you know, like, so that's another good good theme for it was us. Like to, you don't know who's what. Yeah, I mean that's another good theme for us to talk about. This, you know, her playing around with. Um, we, we think of sexual reproduction in terms of, you know, what we call bimorphism, right? You've got male and female, and it goes all the way, like, in plants, you know, pollen and eggs and seeds and stuff like that. And we, we do have a few species where it's, they're sort of hermaphroditic, and, and you know, they, they mate in, in other ways. But we don't really have anything where it, it takes uh, three to make it work. I mean, we have, we have relationships where people might have, like, a... Uh, I think three-way. they call it. They call it a, well a three way, right? Or a menage a trois. Or now, now there's actually a word, a truple, right? Um, polyamorous. Yeah. Uh, well, polyamorous opens up the door to like yeah. maybe it could be Four fifty seven, you know, or <laughs> you know, uh, there could be people coming and going. With this, it's definitely three, and it's not just about um, you know enjoyment. It's about this is the way that reproduction has to happen. Um, mm-hmm. And the reason is because in this this race, the uloi is the one who is, uh, you know, monkeying around with the genes more than the others can. So you, you can understand why it would be needed. I mean, Ursula K. Le Guin had, had a story where there were, there were three people involved, and I forget exactly how it worked in, in this, this race um, on a different planet um, with, with sexual relations. But we don't usually think of that. And so this, this winds up, for a lot of the characters, um, seeming kind of monstrous. And... Um, so I'm kind of interested. What were your impressions when you were first reading this? Were you like, "Wow, that's really gross," or, um, "Well, that's kind of interesting," you know, or "Wow, that would never work." Or <laughs> I wish I would have taken. You know, I said I read the song those many years. I wish I would have taken some notes. Um, at first, I think I just saw it as, well, I, I thought it was kind of neat the fact that they could manipulate genes and really make her stronger and healthier and all yeah. that and get rid of disease and and. Um, but I, I just found that very manipulative for some reason. I found I found the the Anakali to be so manip- I don't kind of manipulative and greedy or selfish. You know, kind of like the Nazis. <laughs> not, not quite like that. Um, well, I think paternalistic well, captures it. Yeah. I mean, you said paternalistic because yeah. they thought they were doing good things for the human race. Yeah. Because they saw the human race as superior intelligence. Yeah. But with this flaw of this hierarchy nice. and com- competition. And by taking that out, increasing survival. Yeah, I mean, they call it the contradiction, and the contradiction is is that apparently, in their experience, most uh, with most uh, intelligent races, the more intelligent they get, the less hierarchical they are. But with us, they realize the danger of hierarchy. Yeah, and, and so actually, that that's that, there's some interesting stuff that she said about. Um, why she wrote this well, stuff. Yeah. Well, Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, um, let's, you talk about that first, about the about Reagan Bob, and the political Bob movement. Reagan, yeah. Okay, so let, yeah, let's jump to like the second one. Where she says, come back During the country. early part of the Reagan era, there were people who thought we could win a nuclear war and rid ourselves of the Soviet mm-hmm. Empire. I thought they were nuts, but they were there. And Reagan got into office in spite of the fact that he thought a nuclear war was winnable. I got my idea for the Xenogenesis books from Ronald Reagan because he was advocating this kind of thing. I thought there must be something basic, something really genetically wrong with us if we're falling for this stuff. And I came up with these characteristics. The aliens arrive after the war, and they tell us we have these two characteristics that don't work and play well together. They're, they are intelligent, and they tell us we're the most intelligent species they've come across, but we're also hierarchical. And I put this after the big war because it's kind of an example. We've one-upped ourselves to death, just our tendency to one-up each other as individuals and groups, large and small. It has a greater consequence if you combine it with intelligence. I think it's completely true. If you have two elk fighting over who's going to make food, the consequences to them are pretty minor. But if you're going to have somebody sending off people to war for egotistical or economic reasons, both hierarchical sorts of reasons, so this tells us what she means by hierarchy, you end up with a lot more dead people. When you're throwing nuclear weapons into the pie, which is what we were doing back then, you end up with more dead people than any war before. It could have been very bad. Um, so, you know, that gives you an idea what she means by this hierarchical thing. We like to dominate each other. Um, and, and, I mean, it's kind of interesting because from a human perspective, we would say, oh, yeah, of course, you know, everyone's probably like that. And when we look at our most of our sci-fi 
it's always like one species fighting another species. You know, the aliens are coming down and they're going to try to dominate us. So we got to get rid of them and all that. In this world, we're the weirdos. You know, we're we're the aberrant ones somehow. Um, and, and yeah, they, they if if they can just get us to, you know, not necessarily totally breed it out, but learn how to how to manage it, then we could be civilized and and you know fit to live in the rest of the cosmos. What were you going to say? I was just I actually wanted to look it up, but I was thinking too about the fact that there was so much in the early '80s and late '70s about in vitro fertilization and test tube babies, and the first yeah. test tube babies were being born, and mm-hmm. the whole idea of genetic intermixing and the you know, sort of, I think there was a time article, like, where we're, we'll be next, you know, are we actually entering down sort of like some of the, you know, Nazi philosophies of breeding these, like, super children, and, you know, yeah. I mean, there's been so many debates, and they were all sort of stewing around that same time, because 78 was the first in vitro child born in England, and then 81 yeah. in the United States, and there were only 15. We also, we also had, during this time, the increase in biracial yeah. relationships biracial children yeah that's starting to shift yeah and there's a lot of concern about that, that genetics genetic mixing yeah and, and, and here she a lot about the, yeah yeah I mean, he, happening then. yeah and here i mean it, they're they're forced into that in part because look you got human race and, and that that's all you got so you know if, if your mate happens to be somebody who's japanese all right just go with it right the other things um, i think she touched on that she didn't realize she was touching on we see it more clearly today, maybe, and that's tribalism. Okay. Because the people who withdrew and didn't want to be part yeah. of the Ankali, and they were allowed to do it. <coughs> Great. I'm yeah. just going to bring those up. They were allowed, allowed to do it. For, for the time very, being. For, it was a very tribal... Well, even at the end, they were going to be allowed to have go off planet. somewhere and die. But that's because... And that was their own that, but that's because Jodas... Jodas uh, got it negotiated. Now. Yeah, he argues for that. Because um, the rest of the... the Aliens were like, no, that's that's too bad for them, right? So he has to make a case. Yeah, because the Ankali were going, we know better. Yeah, we, the, the purebred Ankali. If we, we let say. them go, they're just going to kill themselves. Yeah. Well, they were very bi. I mean, they were bi. <coughs> yeah. yeah. It, it, in, in comparison to the camp with the with the hybrids, it, compared to the mm-hmm. um, to the ones, the, I mean, they were constantly. You know, they had the guns. They were. Yeah. You know. Burning each other out and enslaving each other, stealing women, yeah, and trying to steal those children and then hack mm-hmm. them up to make them look more human. I mean, oh, yeah, like that was going to help. And yeah, I mean, one of the things that comes through is there's nobody, there's no pure good guys in this. You know, I think some people, she she brought Even this up. It. Well, you know, some people wanted to say, oh, well, she's telling a story where the. Uh, oh, and Collier are the good guys, and, and look how bad human beings are. And it's it's not no, it's not that no, simple. No, no. You know? There's a lot of gray in there. Yeah. Um, now, when when the humans were going to, I know they were not allowed to reproduce. They had taken that away. But when they were going to get their own planet, were they going to be able to produce? Yes. Reproduce? Yes. And they're going to regain the ability to reproduce. Yes. Yeah. Which would mean that they would have to somehow figure out some way, not through genes, but through culture, to overcome the contradiction, or, you know, sooner or later they'd be or a problem. Or blow themselves up again. They're, they're, yeah, well, either they blow, they blow themselves, themselves up again, again yeah. or figure out how to get off the planet and then be a problem for everybody for else. Everybody else. You know, so, <laughs> you know. We didn't get to that part. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the I, I go ahead. This, I found it interesting. I just finished reading the latest Anne Rice book. Okay. It's come out in the Vampire Lestat series. She's written a new one. Um, and this book touches on some similar themes. She, she creates, she introduces a new race. Okay. A new set of creatures in this book. And Are they connected with humans in any way? Or? No, they're connected with an alien race who created them. Okay. And there's some very similar themes to what Butler was doing in Xenogenesis about human beings being self-destructive. Yeah. And these other this other life form being sent in to try to mediate some of it. Huh. Um, and it's kind of just kind of I it's it would take too long to really completely describe the yeah. the theme of the book, but uh, there are some interesting parallels. You know, something that just came to mind um, 
Somebody who I, I frequently teach is Thomas Hobbes, and Hobbes is you know famous for saying, life outside of you know a, a civil society is nasty, brutish, and short. Um, but the, he gives reasons for why this is, and it kind of ties in with what she's calling the contradiction. Um, Hobbes says there's three fundamental motives for human conflict. One is competition. You know, if you've got nice stuff, I want your nice stuff, and so I'll attack you. Um, and then another one is what he calls vanity, which is this wanting to be over, so, you know, be higher than somebody else, and that fits in well with the the hierarchical stuff. But then the, the 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 other one, which is actually the second that he says makes us super dangerous, is what he calls in, in his you know 17th century English diffidence, and by that he means essentially like strategic thinking. Like if I know that you like my book and you're willing to take it from me, I better get the drop on you because I know otherwise you're going to get the drop on me. And as soon as and, and I, but I also know that you you're like me. And so you are probably already thinking, oh, he's going to try to get the drop on me. And you put all three of these together. And Ho this is why Hobbes, in his, his theory, thinks you have a state of nature that's really terrible. And then we have to have a, a uh, civil society with a very strong authority to keep us from monkeying around with each other. And it, it winds up being like a totalitarian state. So it's not a great solution. But the reason why he thinks it's so dangerous is because you've got all three of these working at the same time, competition, vanity, and diffidence. And I think that, that fits in you know, pretty well with what she's describing. And it sounds like what, you know, what you're talking about in the Rice novel mm -hmm. uh, is, is, is going on as well. Yeah, some similar types of themes. Yeah. And it seems like part of what the o Owen Kali want to do is like introduce, like you might say, some breathing space so people can't do the sorts of things that they normally would do to each other. I mean, if you, the, the situations that they're placed in are very state of nature, right? They, they get put out in the, the, the Amazon. Um, they got to build their own huts <coughs> and, and find food. And, you know, um, it's not like they're going back into some technological city. Uh, they're so busy surviving, they can't think about killing each other. They've got to work on good cooperation at they that They still point. manage to spend well, plenty of time killing they each do. other. Because, yeah. because they've got history with that. Well, and, and one of the but shortcuts to, to survival is, you know, you find somebody else who's doing the work of survival and then kill them and take their, their you know, store of nuts or bananas or whatever it happens to be. Well, and <laughs> and I think that's what they're doing. I think what's going on with this was the, the judgment of, well, you're not human anymore, so you don't yeah, so let's you talk about that. You don't count as much as I do because I'm human. Yeah, you brought up that theme of like what is, what, is human? what is it to be human? Does it mean having human DNA and um, not, not actually being able to reproduce, but at least, you know, having sex the traditional way, you know, man and woman, no uloi in the middle or anything like that? Or is, is, is something else, you know, what it means to be human? And do the Uloi, do the Uan Kali get to have a, a, a say in this, or is it, or should it just be just humans saying that? You know, I mean the the, the resistors they called them, right? The resistors, their view is anybody who's, you know, made this devil's bargain, they don't get to to be part of that discussion. Only the purebred humans who haven't been modified and who like you know get tumors and things like that, only they should be able to to decide. Um, clearly, that's not what, what, say, Lilith and her, her brood think. Um, and then the, the poor, you know, uh, hybrids or constructs, you know, they're born into a world where they're not really fully human, not really fully Oankali, and, and even the, the Oankali are like, you got to figure out what you're going to turn into, <laughs> you know? <laughs> that's that's kind of kind of awful. Once they go through their... Puberty, they're change, they're yeah. changes, and they look. I mean, they start off looking human, and they then they end up looking more anakali when they yeah. when they grow those arms and stuff like that. You know, yeah, so, second set of arms. Well, you know, there's that one who the changes go really bad with, and like almost degenerates into oh, that girl, yeah, um, almost like a mollusk or something, right? Yeah. Well, she was headed for being an uroi, and then yeah, things went. She got kidnapped. And right. She didn't have access right to yeah. the stimulus to help her change. Yeah. And she she was deprived of what she needed to make the trend, the, the metamorphosis. Yeah, but I mean, she like sort of regressed. Right. 
uh, to the point where she, she just wanted to not exist. Um, she never really did come back to anything. Yeah. Well. I mean, she came back to something, but never their full potential. potential. Yeah. So, so what do we think about this human thing? What, what is, let's say we were in this world. Um, would you guys be resistors? Would you guys be, I don't know, the, you know, essentially collaborators? Um, you know, how would, how would, what, what sort of attitude would you have towards these Owen Kali and constructs and other humans? Well, I'd, I'd probably be, I'd probably go along with I, that myself. I'd probably, as much as creepy as I've thought about that, <laughs> I probably would find that a better way of life because the, the resistors, everything was just so desperate, you know, just the yeah. survival was so desperate. And, and there was always that aggression and anger and um, resentment that you had would just be there where, you know, yeah, you've got the, the Uloi guy there, but, um, but there was a peacefulness and kind of a, and plus if you're sick, you got well, which is kind of cool. Yeah. Um, and then, I, I don't know. I think it, it could be a generational thing because Lilith and that group was first generation. Right. Yeah. And Lilith was never comfortable with it. Yeah. She always was uncomfortable with it, but decided to, to do it. it yeah. Was, it was the better choice. But she's um, making a decision too for the human race as well. She was making a decision. They pitch it that way. Yeah. It, but she was never comfortable with it. She never was all in. Yeah. Uh, but then the later generations adapted and bought into it as a, a, a good way of living. I was just going to comment that, um, you know, this is, as you've you know, discussed, all about the human and the non human. Yeah. And preserving the human. Yeah. And if we go back in time, we had a lot of races that we would say were subhuman mm -hmm. Native peoples, African Americans, which you could say are Native peoples in a sense. Yeah. Or whatever. And, and, and so it wasn't so much. Uh, yeah, and they were declared sort of not human, but they were really declared as not Christian or not the I. They were the other. Yeah. yeah. You know, and, and it was the I that uh, was like me, whether we were the chosen, whether we were the saved. But it may have come originally from this self-protective nature that says we, we, if, if we left the, the um, chaos into our domain then who knows what would happen so they must yeah. convert first somehow and it, not so much to be human but just to be more like I and less like the other and, and in this sense it's being defined as human but we clearly said native peoples were subhuman I mean that's why we could destroy them they weren't Christian they weren't saved or whatever and you can go back through before history and similar things were done or religious wars I mean because there were the saved and the chosen and and, well, when, um, when she was writing these things, I thought the racial thing, you know, the, the, the interracial relationships and, and multiracial children, because yeah. about the time she was writing it, we were still fighting um, miscegenation laws in the South. Oh, yeah. The loving Supreme Court mm -hmm. decision yeah. happened in the 80s. Yeah. I think it was late 70s, early 80s, I think it was. So at the time she's writing this, we're still fighting the, the issue of if you mix a white person and a black person, you get this thing right, right. that's not pure. That, that yeah, didn't neither one nor the other. It's neither yeah. one nor the other. It's yeah. never applied to slavery, though, because when they were having all kinds of fun with the slaves. Well, in, 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 the, in the slavery times, though, if you had... Well, that's, that's why the one-drop rule came Yeah, with misogynation yeah. laws, yeah, yeah, yeah. if you had one drop of black blood, right. you were a slave. You were black. You know, and, and so there what, was no what she's doing in her narrative... <clears throat> world then is not just um, having you know people of all different races you know s sort of thrown together and, and, and mating with each other so that it might be you know like Lilith is a black woman um, you know and, and she's attracted if I remember right the first guy she's attracted to is Japanese and then he gets killed mm -hmm. and then there's others so you've got all of that but then you introduce a higher level of miscegenation which is now you're mixing with these aliens so some of the critics have been like, she not only manages to like talk about interracial stuff, but 
and and they they use the word bestiality. I don't think that's right because they're because bestiality, you know, bestiality would be like with a lower species, right. right? Rather than with another intelligent species. But you know, she's like really throwing the gauntlet down, right? Because it's well, not just Star Trek work where you know maybe uh, her and Chekhov could could kiss and and you know people would be oh this is terrible, but you know, but it's a it's an alien race. Well, I start Star Trek had that of course with Kirk. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, so, <laughs> Kirk, well, no, Kirk and green Kirk women from, from yeah, 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 and yeah. stuff well, it's like that. So the horror was the flashpoint. Yeah, I think you're, I think flashpoint. you're right about that. Yeah. So yeah. has anybody really? in here done that personal DNA analysis? See oh, yeah, twenty three and me. Yeah. Did you see what portion? You know? I well, I mean, it, 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 in 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 my well, case, it's kind of it's, it's, it's kind of it's kind of funny because um, mine came up, you know, completely European. But because, you know, this is a total digression, but because I have a Jewish family name, which isn't our real family name, <clears throat> you know, I occasionally get viewers who will say, oh, I can tell his Jewish physiognomy, <laughs> you know, because Sadler's a, a Jewish name. My grandfather didn't know because he was a, probably an anti-Semite or else he wouldn't have picked it. But he wanted something that sounded English, and that's... that's so he changed thing. it when he immigrated? No, he changed He He was born here. He was Serbian, and he wanted to get ahead in business back in the 1920s, and there was a lot of prejudice against Slavs at the time, uh, so he changed it to Sadler. He just picked something that he thought sounded yeah, really yeah. English. And sure. <laughs> well, the idea, of course, is that that's your adopted family anyway. That is true, so yeah. It's not even <laughs> yeah, if, if the funny thing is, is that, so the people who, like, say that sort of stuff, if they were to do their 23 and Me, they'd probably find all sorts of stuff in their background from from the perspective that they have, um, I'm probably more Aryan, you know, using their categories than they are. But they, of course, they, they don't they don't see that. And so they'll say stuff like, "I can look at your forehead and see, you know, that yeah. your Jewish forehead." And I'm like, "Wow, you you don't know." What your culture you're... is like this big in the UK, basically. I mean, it's the tiniest little spot, like compared What's to that? mine. And the twenty three and me, like your map is like. Well, no, I've got um, some Scandinavian and some. Right. What I'm saying is, it's like it's literally right there. Yeah, it's pretty. Mo it's, it's you can't it's get much much wider. more white. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, in the traditional sense. Well, if, uh, if you are Slavic, that was a pretty tight crowd. No, you. Uh, that, that that was my. Oh, that was your adopted family. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, my 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 adoptive dad was Serbian and Polish, but. Well, and the results of DNA tests is shifting daily because. As the databases build, they get more accurate. Yeah, yeah we more keep accurate. getting updates right now until they get those databases filled out. Yeah, because there are parts of the world. Um, my fa my mother's side of the family is from Sicily. That database is too small to be accurate right now. Wow, and it's Sicilians, of course, are kind of a mixture. Oh, we got a little like bit of everything. A, oh, yeah, I mean from from <laughs> the Greeks Spanish, to African, yeah. Greek. Yeah. Turkish, Albanian. The, Nor Albanian. the, the Norse were there for a while. They the Norse, conquered Sicily. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, you know, so going back to, back to this, um, you know, and let's talk about the gene trade some more. Um, what is it that they really like about, you know, sucking up the, these genes? It's, it's you know, the, the sort of stuff that we tend to obsess about in, in terms of race is pretty trivial stuff, you know, like determining how your nose is or... I mean, skin color can help out a little bit, you know, how much you can be in the sun or not. But um, compared to an alien species, you know, or even really, if you think about just comparing us as a species to, to other species that aren't alien because they're, they're from our planet, but they're, they're different from us. If we, if we made that the contrast instead of what she's calling this hierarchical uh, behavior, we probably would be a lot, it would be a lot easier for us to get along with each other, you know. But we don't. I guess it's how we define humanity too. I mean, uh, yeah. we, you know, we 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 come up with a a commitment of of terms as what is human. You yeah, know? like this is what this is what we're going to say is human, and beyond that is not. But it's again, it's it's constructed. It's just what we've made a commitment that we're going to. So well, it's, it's, it's finer it's, than it's that. It's the eye. Yeah. It's yeah. the eye. It's the tribal. Who is the eye today? Yeah, you may be human, well, let me, but you're not part of my tribe. Let me ask a... a, a but I'm, I'm talking human in general. Yeah. What and, would and make there's something There's a need human? for the other. There's mm -hmm. a functional need to have, a, have the, the other, other because it unites the eye. I yeah. Mean, yeah, but that's tribalism. But I'm looking at pure humanity. What would make you 
what we would consider a human being. You know, I mean, you well, can be a another. There's on that now with artificial intelligence. Right. Is, well, not just that. Right we also these people now are doing sort of do itself do-it-yourself uh, gene manipulation. And I don't know if there's anything really to what they're doing right now, but, but sooner or later there's going to be more of that going on. So if I, like, enhance myself in some way, get it, say getting rid of a gene for cancer, am I making myself less human by doing that? Or does that still, like, within the range of tolerance? Here, I think that's right? going to keep adjusting as we keep adjusting. What if I decide that I want my eyes to be... Like uh, able to see colors that that human beings can't normally see. Well, no, I mean if those Blue are the qualities that we still things. consider, it human, does. We, we make yeah. decisions. It, it feeds into the hierarchy. The, the oh, well, that's well, that's true. Guys floating around, we don't know about. Yeah. And we come up with a list of qualities that we just say what is human. You know, it's we just have this list of of things, and I, will, will they adjust as as we you know evolve or not? Um, yeah. And you know what was something. You know, anthropithic, anthropithecus or whatever was that human? Not quite, because we decided they didn't have X, Y, Z, they didn't have this yeah. sort of intelligence, they didn't have this big of a cranium. By the time you got to Homo, you know, we we have made a, a list of things that we consider human, whether it's emotions, it's intelligence, it's gene construct, whatever. Well, that's it dangerous is. though, because you can usually find somebody who's missing some of that, and then and then we get that sort of like, mm -hmm. okay, we can. It's okay to get after them. You know, like if we if we picked, um, say, having empathy. You know, it was Philip K. Dick really really liked that as sort of a measure of being human. Um, it shows up in a number of his stories. Um, but there are people who lack empathy. Should we then say, well, they're they're not human the way the rest of us are? Well, that's it. Yeah. And you have animals that have emotions, and they have family, yeah. and they have family structures, and they have all of these things and too. Empathy, and, they and they have, have all of this kind of thing, and they have self healing, and they make, can make tools to some extent, but they don't have intelligence. So we come up with a. Or they don't have the level of intelligence we think is right. Is or 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 self yeah. or, or self conscious. I mean Basically. that kind of thing. They're not like self aware. So I think we these are just you know characteristics that we have defined as human. Now will they change? As well, we, we change define probably. the eye and the not eye for protection, I think. That's Real or perceived. And I don't I don't consider that as human. But human, human is a definition. Well is the definition of I am I define human, you define human, it's who I define as I and you as I mean most I. most cultures most cultures are ethnocentric, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I mean it, it's it's interesting because you look at any highly developed culture up until recent times, and they all like have words for like themselves as the, the human beings, mm -hmm. and everybody else as, as like the barbarians or subhumans or you know. Um, well, the backlash in Europe right now with Brexit and some of the others is a, is a backlash to that attitude. That oh, the, the Brexit, the, the, the Brexit people for it. Are you you're the saying people in right? favor of Brexit in favor of the movement in get rid of the immigrants, Germany, yeah, France. Can't have those immigrants mixing with us. Yeah, we got, the, we need, it's we need a tolerance to point. We can't have so there's, many. There's a we're point. over the limit. It's like wait, we're over the limit. You know. <laughs> yeah. That'll, that'll make us not well, appreciate and, uh, them. I mean, often, not often, they're not, I mean, they're yeah, not, they're not us. Well, they're oftentimes, not too, that... They're not human, though. They're just saying that they're, that they're different in other ways. That's often, a line. Yeah. They're drawing a line. Yeah. But oftentimes, that fits in with the hierarchy thing, too, because there's this, this sort of sense with the anti-immigrant. They're getting over somehow. They're getting special treatment. So that needs to stop and, you know, kick or them out. It and, changes the competition. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting. One of the trouble points for us is, well, there's there's a number of professions where if we wanted to be really, really strict about immigration, we'd be screwed. We're dead. You know, <laughs> forget uh, doing any any AI stuff because you're going to need a lot of computer science people, and we don't we don't generate enough of them here. So, you know, South Asia is supplying us with, with a lot, or doctors, or, you know, uh, pick quite a few Some other professions. Areas. Yeah. So... I don't think we'll ever actually sort this out, <laughs> this, this, this well, immigration. I, I, well, I, see, what, I see that as more discrimination, as they say, anti-human. I, I, they're still people. They're not, they're, but they're just discriminating. Well, I think, it, I think quite, some of the people who are anti-immigration speak with a rhetoric that, that shows that they think that the immigrants are not human. They're, they're less than. Yeah. yeah. They're, they're not human in, a, in the same sense that whatever group they're favoring is Well, is if you human. want something from someone, like, like when you wanted slavery, 
we, they, they were three eighths of a or whatever three fifths of a person. We just you know determined that as society because yeah. we needed to subjectify objectify them. Well, but even beyond that, during the civil rights era, if you were in the South, what was being preached from the pulpit was that those people weren't human. That blacks were not as intelligent. There's still people doing and that. And there are still today. people doing that. Yeah. that and, and I think they're doing it for, for certain immigrant groups. Yeah. They take the view that, well, our group is better, so they're lesser. Well, look at homophobia. See, you're coming from I mean, sociological, I'm kind of scientific, because I, you know, I have a science thing. So to me, scientifically, what else would you call them? They're, they're, they're not. It has nothing to do with science. Oh, yeah. so they're, so they're coming no, from a sociological. It has nothing to do with yeah. science. Don't use the word human. Just use the word I. How are they like well, me? I'm in power. I'm entitled. They should be like me. I'm in control. If they want to come here and my I'm domain, I'm using my analytical brain. That's too hard for me to do. No, that. but I'm saying you're hung up <laughs> on the word human. I'm saying I, I think there's, a, what there's a broader, yeah. deeper. Yeah, what you're saying is that the I, the letter I, meaning whoever is defining we. it, just yeah. you know, or we, yeah, whatever. Well, I understand. But, I see that as discriminate or bigotry. Well, but it's, it, but it has the same effect. It's both, it's, though. You are declaring somebody else's persona non grata. I mean, yeah. just saying. You know, you're on that side of the table, and this is a good side of the well, table. A, I mean, come over it's here a and spectrum, like, oh, because yeah. it, it runs the spectrum from discrimination yeah. to you're an animal. I mean, it, here's the thing. Though, so, it, 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 so far below me. It could, okay. be the, it could be the case that it is, from a rational perspective, irrational, and yet be an integral part of human nature that we keep on doing this, because you know, it does seem to be something almost like a cultural constant across cultures that... You know, there's somebody singled out as 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 the other, as the ones who we don't have to. Which is who we go to war against. I mean, yeah, and, and and you're right; it is irrational, and and which is the con and, the conflict that she's talking about. Yeah, I mean, we, our our is, higher intelligence should be able to get us to the point where we can recognize that this is irrational, but because of the hierarchical nature, people are also able to exploit it. You know, I mean, if you think about like what what functional good does. Uh, say, you know, traditional anti-black racism do for the poor white Southerner. I mean, at one point they could say, well, I'm better than, than a black man, uh, but that was purely illusory. I mean, they were totally getting screwed by, by the people who, who had power. And now in the present, I don't even think that's there. It, 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 there's, you know, the only thing is a purely imaginary benefit. Um, and you can say, wow, that, that's totally irrational. And yet when you go and you point that out to some people, they're like, no, that, that's good enough for me. You know? Well, that's real. Um, okay. Yeah. And, and, you know, that's, yeah. It's, I mean, the, the prospects for, I mean, here's, here's a, another good idea. Would it actually take having an alien race to come here and sort of impose stuff on us to sort through this kind of stuff well, or well, yeah. or can we or can do we do we really have a, a chance of like making real progress so that you know I, i'm not saying we, we wouldn't want to discriminate in any way like if people commit crimes i think we probably want to put them in prison right uh, if people are you know horrible to each other i think we probably do want to be discriminating in that respect but any sort of like that's accountability yeah i mean at this point uh, racial discrimination uh, you know, I, I'm I'm happy that I live in a time where I think the people who understand things well say that's that's done. You know, that should be over with. But it's not. Well, <laughs> right, it's not over with because there's still plenty of people who get something out of it, or you know, um, or you know, also have you know experiences draw the wrong conclusions from it. Um, but would it take would it take actually having aliens come in and say, okay, we're fixing things because you humans are too stupid to, to or too intelligent and too hierarchical to actually get things right? I don't think so. Why not? I don't know. I think another. Th I think that I think that would be something that could do it. I don't think it would be <laughs> yeah. necessarily. I think another way that could do it. If you look into like U.S. Soviet like I guess antithesis to each other. Yeah. Like they were the great enemies. Of yeah, and in many ways, not always, not completely, but I think over time, had the antithesis kept on going on and on and on, that both sides would have become more and more unified. In our, I guess, in the United States, racial things would have come more together. Um, look at something like uh, uh, the Hmong that came over. I mean, they've integrated yeah. extremely well compared with people who did not have that same, we are 
allies in war against a common enemy. If there's some sort of adversary, there's some sort of like, I, I don't know, like a, I don't want to say like a great wall, because that's not what I'm trying to go with it, but like, if there's like this great goal to be had, and it's something that's more tangible that somebody can actually put their finger on and talk about, as a small kid. Some great project you're well, talking about. Well, you will about. unify against a common enemy is what you're trying to say. Yeah, but enemy could, the, could there be something else, like, for say, a, for a project. well, like, like, going to the stars, right? Could we, could, instead of, instead of, like, we're going to fight those bastards over there, could it be something like, I don't know, we're going to, we're going to clean up the oceans, or we're going to... Right, like, we're, I mean, if the bee population actually does get decimated, there's not yeah, going to be kinda. an option. You know, people are going to have to get over all sorts of tribal issues if they want to eat and survive. Well, I think environmental things are going to be a massive pressure in that, that respect. Well, um, I mean, that's what I'm saying. So that's a project well, uh, and, and that would require a solution. Yeah, and uh, I mean, one of the solutions is let's find some other people, round them up, and kill them off. Um, and maybe we can get some resources out of them, which is what we've done that, that, so far. That's what but I'm thinking. If we, even if they get environmental pressure, there's too many people with guns that will just take what they have, what they want. You know, unfortunately, I don't know. But that that's only a single that. generation that doesn't actually solve the issue. Yeah. Like that's, I mean, that's sort of like the zombie apocalypse. Like you're just trying to stay alive for now. It's not actually world building or allowing for any kind of like, you know, future generative properties because that yeah. doesn't solve the problem. I eat, but my children don't eat. If, if, you right. look, if you look at the body of science fiction and speculative fiction, there are an awful lot of the storylines. Humanity doesn't make the shift until we nearly wipe ourselves out. Yeah. Right. Um, Frank Herbert's books happen after a, a war that decimates the human race. Against the machines. Against the machines. Yeah. Um, Star Trek. Star Trek, this, humanity on Earth doesn't rise until we wipe ourselves out in a, in a nuclear war. Oh, I didn't know that. We're, we're, we have it, when it, the, it begins to rise again after a nuclear war. Yeah. And the Vulcans show up and go, we have a better way. <laughs> wow. That happens, uh, yeah, that that, that storyline, gets we wipe ourselves, co pretty close to wipe ourselves out in a, in a nuclear war. And then we come back. Then we're more tractable, right? <laughs> yeah. And yeah. that seems to be a theme in an awful lot of science fiction storylines and some yeah. of the fiction storylines that humanity doesn't ever overcome this until they nearly wipe we nearly wipe ourselves out. Yeah. yeah but that's very human though. That's very human characteristic. It's hard to change until you're almost on death's door. And then that's a lot of <laughs> that's a lot of the impetus for changing a lot of times if Let's just say, you know, you have And some, sometimes not even that. You have, right? like, an illness of some size. Well, you really need to change it. And until you're just about there, say, okay, now I'm going to finally change my diet or do this or yeah. do whatever the heck else. But it, it usually, or um, if somebody has got a really deep set, you know, ism or whatever the heck, and, and find, then all of a sudden something will happen to them that's so detrimental that they can change. But it takes something. I mean, after 9-11, this country kind of came together after that for a little while. That's, Very short while, That, that, yeah. that, short that while. seemed to yeah. be something that we could have, that we all sort of, you know, the shock of it rallied, you know, the country for a bit. Um, there was also a bit of the let's, let's go get those bastards now, though. I think uniting it too, right? You know. Well, well yeah, because it was a common, it was a common enemy. enemy. There was also political manipulation. Yeah, it right. was like you're, everybody's afraid now, so now we can take away some of your rights. Well, that, well, that all, well, that all happened too. But I mean, that was the, all happening too. The, the the event itself was such a shock that for a brief period of time, it did bring the country together uh, for a little but bit. Getting back to what you're saying before, and, and that's correct that there's a sense of massive doom and gloom that weaves its way through a lot of science fiction. Let me ask the question. When do you think the, the term science fiction first really started being used? That then people could say, oh, I, yeah, I want to write that sort of stuff. That built in the science technology stuff. Was it yeah. after the bomb was developed? No, you know, before that. Well, was way before. Yeah. Yeah. So but the, the, did some people start to anticipate the bomb before we had it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, But it was oh, yeah. still the idea of the bomb that we could annihilate the planet yeah. or most yeah. of the planet. In the early 19th century, they were writing science fiction. No, but they were anticipating what were, what were they something calling it, though, cataclysmic yeah. within our power that we you would know, not rationally manage. I don't remember who this was, but I, I remember coming across it recently. There was somebody, 
There was a pulp writer in science fiction who was writing, and he got enough things right sort of by chance about um, the Manhattan Project that they actually told him not to write anymore well, about that. that. You remember who it was? No. But he, 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 so he was just sort of like speculating about how this right. might work, you know? And he, he, he got it right, and somehow the military authorities found out, you know? But, yeah, I mean, they, they were in, in the, the stuff from the, like, 20s and 30s, <laughs> There were already people thinking about, like, you know, weapons that could, like, destroy a whole planet, you know. Um, so it's, it's being theorized about. And, of course, you know, Lovecraft in horror has, like, monsters or things that could, like, destroy the entire human race as well. Um, well, there was also early religious writings where the people or beings that came from other places were simply you know, either angels or prophets from afar. I what mean, do you have in mind? Ragnarok? <laughs> that's interesting. Well, I it, wasn't thinking of Ragnarok, but that's, I mean... That's a world end, yeah. Yeah. At least for this world. Um, well, Incan, uh, some of the Incan and Aztec. Yeah, the Aztecs with the ages, yep. you know. Yep. True, yeah. What if Western Christianity thought the world was going to end then? Uh, well, at that time, it was actually... Each year. <laughs> uh, yes. But especially around the year 1000. Yeah. yeah. But by the time they started freaking out about, okay, the next year is actually going to be 1000, it was actually 1016 in reality. Yeah. They're thinking, like, because it was like the Julian calendar, like the, the Gregorian calendar. Gregorian calendar and all that, yeah. 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 Well, and then there, were, there was the, the whole, you know, millennialist movement from, like, the 1840s on... Um, with Miller and then uh, you know a bunch of other, they they kept on having to revise the date, you know. Um, and there's there's other. I mean, there, there are other groups. Yeah. But what was it that you had in mind? Like you know, super powerful beings destroying things, or? Well, I mean, it's not so much super powerful beings destroying things, but the entire Judeo-Christian mythology around angels and. I mean, that's very much about beings from another realm, and we go to this other realm if we're well-behaved. Oh, like heaven and hell, you mean? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's a little bit different, but the idea that there's somehow this other way of existing in the universe, and we can either earn it or not. Yeah. You know, I mean, I would say that, to your point about humanity and, and not being willing to change until things are cataclysmic, I think that's, it's it's sort of predicated on a certain amount of like socioeconomic comfort though because I think that that's the kind of lifestyle a person can adopt if most of their needs are actually being met so I think that that in and of itself isn't enough to be a human characteristic because there's plenty of people who aren't saying like yeah I'm going to wait until I'm really really hungry before I find food or I'm going to wait until the well's almost dry and then I'll go looking for water I mean it's that's the kind of like laziness well, there's, well, there's usually, usually in, in a village like that. There's usually like one or two guys who are like, yeah, you know, the, this this well's not going to last forever, and everyone else is like, we'll worry about that later. You know, don't talk about that too much, or we're going to throw you down the well. You know, but I'd say self self preservation is is certainly a human characteristic, even though we do so many things that yeah are, are, are destructive. Destructive. Self -destructive. Well, I think <laughs> sure. if, you, if you look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, I right think once humans tend to reach a level of feeling safe and secure, there's a tendency to just let it be. Right. I mean, we have, we have a lab mix who will eat as if she were starving to death, as many labs, I guess, do. I think it's kind of a lab trait. most dogs do. She would eat herself to death. If we just kept giving her food, she would have no problem. I don't think she'd stop. No, you know? probably not. And <laughs> that's, you know, I mean... That's she's that's meeting her of, needs. That's a trait of the species. Right. Most dogs, most dogs would do that. But there that. are those of us people who are in danger of doing the same thing just by not dealing with issues of weight or health or whatever else. There are people who have like they they smoke through a tracheotomy. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. the stoma. Yeah. 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 yeah, I mean it's it's amazing. That's the number one. Well, that's the number one addictive. thing about the <laughs> Freighter Cancer Center when you go in there is that it just reeks. Of cigarettes. Oh, really? I mean, now in oh, 2017, it's a phenomenon that yeah. I can't even understand. So, I mean, it's it's 
you know, yeah, the self-preservation and self-destruction. Well, so, more like yeah, but cigarettes are so addicting that the part of the brain, I mean, they even had, they've done so much study yeah. on that. But, I mean, even with people that were looking at AIDS patients early on, when they were just starting to come out with the, these, co these cocktails, and they were offering them a cocktail for their AIDS or a cigarette, and they took cigarettes. Because their brain said, you, wow. you, you can live without food, you can live without all the stuff, but you cannot live without nicotine. Right. Your brain is telling you that. Right. So and there's and that's that's what addiction, you know, it, and it, it just. It what if we could be rebred so that you know addictive behavior, or addictive things couldn't actually turn into, you know, that addictive complex with you know the brain. You just have fun changing. with no problems. Yeah, I mean, would, would <laughs> that yeah, would, would we? Have to put little things in your brain to turn things on and off. Oh, with directly stimulate the pleasure centers? Yeah. <laughs> One of the authors we talked about, the world that he developed had that. Well, there was, there was, uh, there was a, it wasn't was one that we thing. talked about. Larry N Niven had that ring world thing, and, and his main character um, starts out as being, I forget exactly what they call it, but it was somebody who'd like jack in, and he just like, you know, they they connect directly to your pleasure center and stimulate it. Mm -hmm. And of course, it is very debilitating because once somebody starts doing mm -hmm. that, they're never going to stop. Yeah, that, that one lady gets fucked up at the end by it. I don't remember because it's been so long since I've looked She's at like it. She was 200 years old or something, and she had like this, uh, like, like if you had it too much, you'll get like, like you'll go after that for like, the rest of your life, or something. Yeah, the morphine drip. Yeah, it's something like that. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, there, there was this alien that was with the group that did it to some two hundred year old chick that they found in some spaceship that was red, I think. And they got her basically addicted to, to the feeling of oh. seeing his the main character's presence. Oh, interesting. Yes. And then that was like the female like counter in part because the other female lead like left right before the end. Hmm. It's been so long since I've, I've looked at it that uh, I don't know. That might be one that we end up doing for for, for uh, next year. So we should actually bring this to to a close. Um, so this is a great ending to the year. Um, we've got a lot of new uh, talks uh, next year coming up, and uh, thanks for all of your participation and discussion.